Hello viewers, thank you for joining me. There are still quite a few shows, many of them longer shows, around 50 episodes or more, that I've been trying to find time to go back and rewatch so I could review them, but I didn't want that project to get in the way of continuing to watch new shows, so that's what I chose to do with my extra time this summer, and I decided to start with Soul Eater. Soul Eater takes place in a world where some people have the ability to transform into weapons, and the people who can't are left to pair up with a weapon and wield them as their meister. The Grim Reaper, Lord Death, started the DWMA, or the Death Weapon Meister Academy, to train weapon meister pairs to go out and hunt Keishin souls, and a Keishin is basically a person who's so evil their soul is warped into a demon. If a Weapon Meister pair can collect 99 Keishin souls and then the soul of a witch, that weapon will be transformed into a Death Scythe, or one of Lord Death's personal weapons. This is where we are when the story starts, and we're introduced to the first of the three main Weapon Meister pairs. Maka and Soul have collected their 99 Keishin souls, and now only need the soul of a witch. I've always loved the dynamic between Maka and Soul. They both have their moments where they're reckless and hot-headed, but whenever this happens, the other person will fall almost effortlessly into the role of the responsible, level-headed one. It feels like a very natural partnership. But unfortunately for them, the woman they think is a witch is actually just a cat with a lot of magic power, and after this mistake, Lord Death confiscates all their previous souls, and they're back at square one. I tend to think of Soul and Maka as THE main protagonists, but that may just be because they're introduced first. In truth, the first three episodes are all prologue episodes, and each of the weapons and meisters get about the same amount of screen time and character development throughout the series. The second pair is made up of a loudmouthed assassin named Blackstar and his much quieter weapon, Subaki. Tsubaki can turn into a variety of weapons, and Blackstar actually is very powerful, but their success rate is abysmal due to Blackstar prioritizing putting on a show over everything else. But they also make a very good team, and their balancing act is a little more obvious than Soul and Maka's. They work because Tsubaki's the only one with the patience to put up with him, but they're not one note either. I'm a big fan of episode 11, where we get to see both Blackstar's down-to-earth side and Tsubaki finally standing up for herself. In fact, in general, I'd say I definitely found a greater appreciation for Blackstar this time around, whereas the first time I just found him to be annoying. And that leaves us with Death the Kid, Lord Death's son, and his two weapon partners, Liz and Patty. You'll notice that all three teams are actually quite skilled, but they're all held back by their own little quirks, too, and the fact that Kid needs two identical weapons is his quirk. He's got severe asymmetrophobia, and while it's mostly used as a punchline, we are shown how it could cause some legitimate problems. For example, he runs into a few perfectly symmetrical villains that he can't bring himself to destroy. Anyway, that's the basis of this world and the story. I found in the past that, if I want the review to have any substance, the longer a show is, the harder it becomes to write a review that's free of spoilers, so while it's not the plan to give away too much, you can be on guard for spoilers from this point on. So I think another reason I tend to view Maka as THE main character is because she gets all the earliest character development, and this development introduces yet another main protagonist, and potentially my favorite character. I would consider Maka's main flaw early on to be overconfidence. She's the bookworm of the group, top of the class and all that. And don't get me wrong, her confidence and general badassery is something I love about her character, but she's too quick to assume she knows everything, and it's this overconfidence that leads her to rush into a church where she just sensed a whole crowd's worth of human souls being destroyed at once. And inside the church, she finds the child of a witch named Krona and the demon sword Ragnarok. Not to go off on a tangent so soon, but let's talk about Krona for a minute. Whenever I spent time amongst the Soul Eater fandom, the most 
passionate debate I saw revolved around Krona's gender. Krona was intended to be gender neutral. The English language doesn't have a great track record with gender neutrality, so they fell back on male pronouns in both the English version of the anime and the manga. Even though they had a perfect excuse to use they and them, as Krona and Ragnarok are two consciousnesses occupying one body, so there's a good chance no one would have even questioned it, but I digress. To make things even more complicated, there are places in the Japanese version of the manga that refer to Krona as female. Anyway, this debate is one of the things I remember most about being a Soul Eater fan around the time the anime first came out, so as a disclaimer of sorts, I became familiar with Soul Eater through the English version of the anime and tend to refer to Krona as a he. If we could kindly refrain from some sort of fan war in the comments over this subject, it would be greatly appreciated. Anyway, the witch Medusa melted down the demon sword Ragnarok and replaced the blood of her own child with it, so Krona's blood is itself a weapon, and Ragnarok is capable of either hardening it so they don't get hurt, or letting it be spilled only to use those blood droplets as extra weapons even outside of their body. This makes Krona a pretty formidable enemy, especially this early into the series, but every power has its drawbacks. Black blood is a natural transmitter for insanity, supposedly. It is shown later to gradually drive people insane, but Krona has been living with Ragnarok his entire life, and even for Krona, who definitely has his moments, total insanity doesn't seem to be his default setting. I mean, even sane Krona is always a little off, but I'd be more willing to attribute that to a lifetime of constant abuse, to be honest. I mentioned that Krona is one of my favorite characters, but his real character development doesn't come until the second half of the series, so for now, this first encounter is all about Maka. This first fight gets Soul seriously injured, and would have gotten them both killed if one of their teachers hadn't come to the rescue. So this encounter really scars Maka, and for a while she goes from being too reckless to being too cautious. To be honest, it's not really that she finds a middle ground, but more that she goes back to charging into every battle fearlessly, but I think there was still a lesson to be learned here, and I liked the precedent this set. This was definitely a show where characters could be affected by and learn from past mistakes. Before I jump into the main conflict, there's something else that I really loved about Soul Eater. When I first watched Soul Eater, I was also waist-deep in catching up on Naruto. For the first time, anyway. So I'd gotten pretty tired of the shonen trope of the main character needing a rivalry to constantly test himself against and grow from, and I have to admit, Soul Eater got me. Because at the start of episode 6, it looked like that's where they were going. It's Kid's first day of school, and Soul and Blackstar, who've heard tales of Lord Death's son's abilities, challenge him to a fight. Not with their actual partners, mind you, with each other. And it turns out that no, it's not so simple that any Meister can just pair up with any weapon. Their soul wavelengths have to be compatible. So this one scene that I feared might single-handedly drag down the show a bit quickly became one of the funniest and most fondly remembered fights in the whole show. It's just so over the top and ridiculous, and it helps that Kid fits really well into their group of friends afterwards, with no hard feelings. It doesn't sound like such a big thing to ask now, but at the time, seeing a team where everyone could just get along was really refreshing. And I'm a sucker for a good friendship story, so this aspect of Soul Eater was still a high point rewatching it all these years later. The revival of the original Kishin, the source of all evil and madness in the world, becomes the main conflict for both halves of the series. About halfway through the show, Medusa does succeed in reviving Ashura from where he was imprisoned under the school, and he escapes into hiding until the actual final conflict but it wasn't a total loss for the DWMA. It's during this conflict that Sol and Maka have their final fight with Krona and Ragnarok. 
To give you a bit of backstory, Sol's injury during their first fight infected him with some of Krona's black blood, and he's been resisting the influence of a literal demon in his mind ever since. During a soul resonance, a technique that temporarily connects the Meister and weapon souls to make them stronger, he passed on some of the black blood to Maka. They quickly realize that the only way they stand a chance against Krona is for Maka to give in to the black blood's influence completely, which will make her nigh invincible, but at the price of her sanity, so that she can resonate with Krona's soul and stop him that way. Because it's become pretty clear by now that Krona isn't really evil, just a little unhinged by years of abuse, and he'll do anything Medusa says because she's his only connection to anyone. Luckily, Maka is able to get through to Krona, and they join our heroes, and this final battle with Krona is still one of my favorite anime fights of all time. So the Kishin's release marks the halfway point, and the second half of the series shifts gears a bit as the focus turns to tracking down the Kishin and preparing for a possible full-scale war. In a nice sort of contrast, our three Weapon Meister pairs are brought together officially as one big team at the same time that their own personal stories get underway. I think Kids is the most interesting. As he's sent out on one mission after another to collect magic tools in preparation for the fight against Ashura, he starts to suspect his father isn't telling them everything, so the mystery of the Kishin becomes a personal mission for him, and it ended up tying into something else. I found the witch's motivation very interesting. Very simple, but sometimes a simple argument is still a good one. Their reasoning for doing what they do is just… Why does the Grim Reaper get to define what's right and wrong in the world? The easy answer is because he came out on top in some past struggle and those in power get to write the rules. That's true of the real world, too. But it's a valid argument, and it got me thinking. After a few generations of the world being run this way, it becomes a cycle. Because Lord Death has ruled witches evil by nature, it makes it so even before they're old enough to be committing any evil acts. And we actually get a concrete example of this. Blackstar's prologue introduces us to a reoccurring antagonist, a kind-hearted samurai named Mifune who has a soft spot for children and has devoted himself to protecting a young witch named Angela. Right now, Angela is too young to be a threat to the DWMA, but even if Mifune raised her to follow all of their rules, she would still be a target just because of what she is. Even though a lot of the witches come across as being pretty decidedly evil, I think they make some valid points, and it helped to flesh out the world a bit. From day one, Kid is a little uppity. Not unlike Maka early on, you get the sense that he assumes he already knows how the world works and everything about right and wrong that he needs to, so his little personal journey basically culminating in Kid realizing how young he still is made for a very compelling story in my eyes. A storyline I don't think I could fully appreciate when I first watched Soul Eater almost a decade ago. Though I can say I was in the perfect place in my life to appreciate Krona's story. Krona's development is all about learning to put himself first, despite a lingering loyalty to his mother, and I have to say there are some scenes that turn me into a big mess of emotions no matter how many times I see them. I only wish the actual final conflict had been as satisfying. So let's discuss the Kishin. I think the idea of Ashura and all that he stands for is really interesting. Just his presence being out in the world again is supposed to be enough to slowly spread insanity throughout the entire world, but we only really see one example of this. Their teacher, Dr. Stein, who we're told had a predisposition to madness. And prior to that, when our heroes were fighting to stop Ashura's revival, they experienced hallucinations from being that close to him. But the actual madness isn't long-lasting or widespread enough to feel really threatening, and once Ashura is confronted, he comes across as… kind of pathetic, really. The Kishin himself seems perfectly controlled, until he stops to actually consider anyone else's counter-argument, and then he falls apart. And I found this to be pretty disappointing, because they did such a good job with Krona. 
We'd already been shown that insanity could be very threatening when it affects someone the right way, so the fact that this threat couldn't hold up when it came to the source of all evil and madness in the world left something to be desired. To wrap this up, there are two main critiques that I've heard about Soul Eater. The first, and the one to be expected, is that fans were displeased when it diverged from the manga. I can't really comment on this one, as I haven't read the manga myself, but I can say that the overall flow of the anime felt very natural to me. I honestly couldn't tell you at what point the story starts to split, excluding the final episode, of course, which means they must have done something right. And then we reach the final episode itself, which is the second complaint, and which I can't really defend. I already mentioned that Ashura felt like a weak final villain, and there was another witch that I didn't even mention because she ended up being so disposable, and the excuse the writers create for Maka being able to defeat Ashura is of such the bullshit plot armor variety that I kind of hope this isn't how it went down originally, even if this means Ashura continues to survive long after this conflict. But I will say this. I'm not opposed to anime-only endings on principle or anything, and Soul Eaters is definitely not the worst I've seen. At least it does actually feel like an ending, with the final villain taken care of and each of the three Meister Weapon pairs' individual stories reaching some sort of conclusion. So yes, the final episode was bad, but it wasn't so bad that it takes away from the 50 episodes leading up to it, which were very good. There is so much that this show does well. It could be dark and creepy and lighthearted. The comedic timing was fantastic. Funimation gave it a really good dub if you're a person who watches anime in English. And I love that they weren't afraid to explore emotion. I feel like there are some shows that worry it will take away from how tough their characters are if they're shown being too affected by an emotional trauma. But if anything, I feel like that only makes characters come across as being even stronger. And there aren't a lot of shows that develop this many main characters to the extent that Soul Eater does. So at the end of this journey, I was pleased to find that Soul Eater is still one of my favorite anime I've ever seen. And if you haven't watched it already, I suggest you do. Thank you for watching.